Good evening, and welcome to the American Dance Therapy Association webinar, Adapting Dance Movement Therapy to Telehealth with Jenny Baxley Lee. My name is Laura Wilson. My pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I am the continuing education manager for the American Dance Therapy Association. We are very glad that you are able to join us this evening. The response to this offering has been overwhelming. We had over 300 people register for this webinar tonight. This webinar was organized rapidly in response to the many questions and comments that were appearing on social media feeds, including the American Dance Therapy Association Facebook group. While this webinar tonight does not qualify for continuing education hours, it is meant to be a source of information for you and professional support as you navigate this transition that so many of us are needing to do at this time. Before we get started, I would like to point out a few important details. This presentation is being brought to you via Zoom. However, it is not a meeting, it is a webinar, which means that as attendees, you cannot see or hear each other. However, I encourage you to use the Q&A function and the chat room to voice specific questions you may have for our presenter and there will be significant time towards the end of the webinar for a Q&A. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for on-demand viewing in a few days. Please let the public nature of the recording inform the content of your questions. And while we hope this webinar answers many of your initial questions about dance movement therapy and telehealth, we do recognize that you may have ongoing questions and a need for peer supervision. When the webinar concludes, you will be directed to a survey. Two of the questions in the survey pertain to whether you would be interested in participating in a follow-up Zoom meeting for peer-to-peer -peer support. The ADTA would schedule a meeting for those who are interested and then once the meeting begins, divide the attendees into small breakout rooms where you could interact via your webcams and share challenges, discoveries, and best practices. So if that is something that you would think of as being useful or helpful for you, um, please do indicate that in the post webinar survey. So with that, I would like to introduce you to our presenter, Jenny Baxley Lee. If you have watched the ADTA talks on our YouTube channel, you will recognize her from her talk, Dance Movement Therapy with Veterans via Telehealth. She began facilitating dance movement therapy via telehealth for the VA in 2014. Jenny is a board certified dance movement therapist and is the assistant director and senior lecturer with the University of Florida's Center for the Arts in Medicine in the College of the Arts. She's affiliated faculty with the School of Theater and Dance and the STEM Translational Communication Center and serves on the research committee in the College of the Arts. Jenny is an active member of the American Dance Therapy Association and has served on the editorial board of the American Journal of Dance Therapy as a book and film review editor. Jenny's current research focus includes arts-based practices in palliative care as well as evaluating the use of telehealth to deliver dance movement therapy and the creative arts therapies. And so with that, I just wanna say, Jenny, thank you for doing this on such short notice and for this generous offering. Um, it is, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Laura. It's such a pleasure to be with you. And I wish to welcome you all to my office, my lifeboat. Um, my name, as Laura said, is Jenny Baxley Lee, and my pronouns are she, hers, and her. And I am faculty with the University of Florida and dance movement therapist who practiced from 2014 to 2018 with the VA Medical Center in North Florida and with Creative Forces as part of the National Initiative for Arts and Health in the Military. I wish to begin our time together with a land acknowledgement. Grounded on the earth where we dwell in this moment, I invite us to acknowledge the traditional native inhabitants of the land beneath our feet and with whom we share this land today. May we reflect on our actions and honor the past, the present, 
and the future caregivers of this wondrous and generous planet. If it feels true for you, and you know them by name, I invite you to inwardly name the traditional and contemporary indigenous communities that are local to you. I'll take just a moment for that. I humbly open us with a timeless and timely teaching of the dish with one spoon wampum belt treaty. It's drawn from the great law of peace, which has been shared with me both orally and which I have read. In this great law of peace, we are reminded to never take more than our share, to make sure there is enough for everybody, to not foul or take the dish, and to ensure there is no knife near the dish. So with this, do no harm by either weapons nor words, we enter this time of thinking about how we might adapt our dance movement therapy practices using telehealth. I wish also just to spend a moment acknowledging the ADTA, Margaret, Laura, our DMT ancestors, pioneers, contemporaries, our students, our clients, and our loved ones who allowed us to be here this evening and I wish to take a moment to acknowledge each and every one of you and thank you for this precious hour at a really trying time in our human history. I acknowledge my Creative Forces colleagues, Dr. Sarah Cass at the helm of Creative Forces, my local colleagues um, who are current practitioners in telehealth. This includes Diane Garrison, who is our music therapist, and Heather Spooner. I'm delighted also, of course, to be connected with Allison and Liz, in DC and so many others who are pioneering this gorgeous work uh, with our veterans and our active military. The last acknowledgement I wish to make is that this current crisis requires a need for swift adaptation and collective action. So I'm going to invite us into um, one possible new normal. And this new normal is the possibility that we let go of the perfect and yield to the good and the just. This idea began with Voltaire, quite long ago, but most recently I heard it by Delana Dameron of the Black Art Future Funds in Brooklyn. So we let go of the perfect and we yield to what's good and what's just. And I believe that telehealth practice and adapting dance movement therapy to telehealth practice can be absolutely the good and the just. We don't have to be perfect to begin moving this direction, swiftly adapting to our clients' needs. One key strategy that seems to be helpful for me these days is staying curious and believing in humanity's resilience and adeptness to change. So by believing that we are resilient and adept to change, I'm willing to lean in to the good and the just um, and to let go of the perfect. A few notable examples rise above the clamor these days, and I want to invite you to think a little bit about our gerontologist artist friend, Dr. Ann Bastings. Anne's work is called Time Slips. It's in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I want to lift it up today because it's focused exclusively on meaning making through creative engagement late in life. And she's doing a beautiful job thinking about how those who are living in assisted living facilities can be deeply engaged in low tech ways that are more accessible for them. So I just offer that work as a resource before diving in to our opportunity to develop our telehealth muscles. So while opening a telehealth session, um, I often offer an opportunity to check in and to ground somewhat the way I did just now. I've modeled a little bit of how I might just for a moment ground us. But this welcome in particular was crafted for you, my dance movement therapy committee in a time of crisis in response to COVID-19. So here's where I would like to begin outlining how we'll spend our time together. Now that we've had a welcome and some acknowledgements and I thank you and grateful for the last few minutes of allowing me this acknowledgement in this time, I'd like to, to move us into considering the spaces we might need for conducting telehealth. We'll have a brief movement warm up, and this allows me to demonstrate telehealth practice. Then we'll initiate DMT practice uh, using telehealth. We'll discuss how we, how we begin. We'll talk about adapting practice immediately, sustaining practice in telehealth, and then there'll be just a few closing thoughts. Between each of those sections, we're gonna pause for questions and answers. So again, we'll talk about initiating practice, adapting our practice, sustaining it, and then we'll have some closing thoughts. So I invite you to begin by thinking about the space you might use in delivering dance movement therapy through telehealth. 
Naturally, we'll be thinking about establishing a therapeutic container and the environment is somewhat more uncontrolled than many of us might be accustomed to. So this requires a plan and consideration of spatial and environmental boundaries. The first thought here is privacy, confidentiality and privacy. So for just a moment, I invite us to notice our own spaces where we find ourselves this evening. How did we generate space that was contained? Perhaps we asked someone with whom we live to give us the space across the hour. Maybe we closed a door or locked it. If we had a little extra time to prepare, we might have written a handwritten sign or even painted a sign that's a little more loving and a little less abrupt than perhaps the ways that we got ourselves some space this evening. In this way, we ensure we don't have the disruptions um, that might uh, challenge a dance movement therapy session. Um, just simply by giving the folks around us a heads up, um, closing doors, um, even using earbuds or a, a headset if available can begin to create and craft that kind of private space we're seeking. Of course, we'll be guiding our clients through thinking um, about securing their space on their end as well. The next thing we think a little bit about is sound or audio. We're going to be thinking about music preferences, of course, but we also want to be thinking about how music may lag due to a video connection or how it may translate based on the speakers on our end and the speakers on our client's end. So if you have a source for music um, nearby this evening, I'm gonna invite you to consider in the back of your mind cueing a two or so minute song that's resonating for you right now. And when we have a movement experiential, if you like, you can mute the sound and listen to the song that's really resonating for you. And in this way, we'll generate um, a sense of, of music preference or song selection this evening. I also invite you to choose to mute your audio if for any reason spacious silence is more what you're needing this evening. So really giving, um, giving the individual on the other end of the line, perhaps our client and ourselves a sense of some kind of choice through connection. You wanna ensure that both you and the client have ample space, um, both for seated and standing movement. Um, and you want to notice if there's a flat surface and a chair nearby for other creative processes, especially if you're a multimodal dance movement therapist who likes to utilize some visual arts or um, some creative writing, reflective writing. Um, uh, one other consideration is a space for a secure chair or a stable piece of furniture that does not move or rock or roll. And this provides balance or stability, um, especially for standing movement sequences. Um, and in the past, I've worked with folks with movement disorders, neurological differences, a wide range of medical populations, um, or in physical medicine and rehabilitation. So it's often um, the case that I'm navigating things like dizziness or fall risk. And that feels especially essential when we're in um, a less controlled or secure environment. If you are a multimodal practitioner and you wanna have art supplies on hand, you'll need to plan for this in advance and chat with your client about um, distributing something for them or what they may have on hand at home. Um, and with that, I'd like to open us with a movement warm up, just as I might in the third or fourth session um, using telehealth with a client. So I invite you to not picture that this is our initial session, but perhaps we've already figured out all of our technology and our equipment, our hardware, our software, um, our audio. And now we're gonna move um, together in, a, in perhaps a shared vocabulary we've already developed across the last three or four sessions. On my end, I'm gonna offer us a little drum music you may or may not be able to hear. On your end, I invite you to either mute, select a song you like, or tune in to listen to my drumming. Setting up the music now, I invite you to back away from your screen. That's nice. All right, we're going to focus today or this evening on our head, neck, shoulders, and upper back. So first I invite you to notice your breath. You feel like me, you're already finding the rhythm of your body. Welcome. Beautiful. We're going to begin with simply nodding the head yes. Nodding the head no. Nice and slow, nice and slow, beautiful. Tipping the ear to the shoulder. 
opposite ear to opposite shoulder. Beautiful. One more time, here we go. Full deep breath, beautiful, back to center. Shrug the shoulders up to the ears. You can hear me a little better as we continue circling the shoulders. Really nice. One more of these and let's circle forward now. One more, beautiful. Let's do that movement together again. We're gonna nod yes. Nice and slow, full deep breath here. Coming back to center, we'll nod no. Beautiful, tipping the ear to the shoulder if it's comfortable for you. <sighs> nice, opposite ear to opposite shoulder, beautiful. Back to center and now we're shrugging the shoulders and slowly sinking down. Shrug and sinking down. Let's make a couple shoulder circles here. Noticing the sensations in your body and breathing deeply. Beautiful. Now I invite you to just notice what else wants to move for a moment. So perhaps it's a head roll or perhaps it's your rib cage. It might feel nice to do some circles with the wrists. Beautiful. Or we could gently tug on the fingertips, giving our wrists a nice release. Opposite hand. Beautiful. Let's drop the arms to the side and reach up overhead all together. And floating the arms down. One more of these. Big reach, open the heart, open the chest and lift if it's comfortable for you and let's let the arms float. Beautiful. And last movement together, let's just shake it out. Shake it off, shake it out. Beautiful. Nice. Shake it out. Beautiful. All right. Beautiful. So all kinds of adapting we just did there together, didn't we? That was fun. Um, and I hope you enjoyed just getting a little movement this evening. Laura, you got something? Yeah, I think this is a good opportunity to um, address a couple of the questions that came in while you were moving. Super. Um, in the spirit of letting go of perfect and that we're all adapting <laughs> in the moment, right? right? And, yes. and none of us are set up to do, um, we don't have telehealth studios in our houses. No. Right. So um, some of the questions were, um, you know, do you have suggestions for wearing earbuds to create a safe space while also not restricting your movement? Mm -hmm. um, and then there were some questions about how you navigate making the music loud enough while not 
having a soft voice because a few people had difficulty hearing you, mm-hmm. which is, is of course why you put your headset on. But if you can speak to a little bit of, of navigating those sorts of choices. Sure. So this evening um, I'm using a headset, which is really nice because earbuds can tend to eject themselves from our ears. So it's often about finding the right fit and comfort for you. And this can guarantee that whatever space, um, whatever sound in your space is blocked from what may be moving through the computer, should you find yourself practicing from home or from an office. Um, Often I stream music through my computer and that actually would eliminate the issue of having the phone streaming the music separate and nearby my speaker. So when I have my music playing through my computer, as well as um, telehealth happening in my computer, I have a little more control over the audio that's happening for for the individual on the other end. Still, we often notice a lag, and this can present issues I'll talk about a little bit um, a little bit later in the webinar and some solutions and strategies we've got for some of those issues. But when there's a lag in audio, we find ourselves improvising quickly um, to make sense of what may be happening on our client's end. Great. And um, also I want to acknowledge the reality of this webinar, which is that Jenny can't see any of us. Well, she can see me, That's right. but she can't see all of you. That's right. Um, and in a normal telehealth situation, there would be that two-way That's right. um, interaction because your your patients or your patients and clients would have a webcam. That's right. Okay. Any any other questions for the moment? Um, we're still talking about technology a little bit um, about music. What technology works so that we can hear music as well as the therapist and allow you the possibility to move away from your computer? That's a little bit trickier. Um, Again, it's often about the broadband connection. It's often about the internet connection as to whether or not you hear music in um, synchronicity with the client. Um, So it's not something you can necessarily guarantee. I noticed that I spend a lot of time acting as if we're in sync um, and often there's a one second delay in reality. Um, Sometimes um, I'll have a loved one in the session with a client who can mirror on their end and I can be the observer or witness, which works really beautifully. That's one adaptation. And I've really loved sharpening my observation skills by not being the other mover on the side of mirroring, but being an observer or witness. Excellent, excellent. Okay, um, I'll keep fielding the questions, but Jenny, if you wanna go on to your next, your next sure. thought. Thanks, Laura. So let's talk briefly about getting started using telehealth to deliver dance movement therapy. In a time of physical distance, distance does not have to mean isolation. Um, How can dance therapy be meaningfully adapted to a virtual environment? Well, six years ago, I began adapting a dance movement therapy practice to telehealth, and it was such an exciting challenge through the VA. I practiced as a DMT across those four years on a creative arts therapy team, and I used synchronous, meaning at the same time, versus, say, email, which is a back and forth that is not, that is called asynchronous, Um, and I used clinical video telehealth. So some folks use audio, such as a phone connection, but I used video, which is how you're experiencing me right now. Um, I worked exclusively with individuals and they were rural veterans and it was primarily one-to-one or included their loved ones as their therapeutic goals um, uh, might have uh, might have aligned with their therapeutic goals so because telehealth can be defined so many ways this is just one model of providing clinical video telehealth there are so many models Um, I have not provided telehealth um, by, for example, my smartphone or from my home. There is plenty of resources um, available for navigating these other measures for providing telehealth. I just, I don't know how to use them. So we as a collective are the strongest by coming together with our resources and finding all of the ways that telehealth can be provided. Just want to offer that context as you're thinking about telehealth for your um, circumstance professionally. Um, I was primarily on site in a medical center VA as well. So it was VA issued hardware, VA issued software. But in my experience, telehealth is not a who, what, where, or when so much as a how. And I really want to convey that this evening. Um, You might think of telehealth as a vehicle to get you where you are already going. It doesn't necessarily have to change your course. 
So therefore, I, I believe we're facing a translational task. How do we translate DMT through telehealth? Um, the first consideration is that we're guided by our own discipline's code of ethics and standards of practice. We are guided by our state licensing boards, our employers' policies and procedures, HIPAA guidelines, and so many more. So you'll want to begin by familiarizing yourself with these regulations. They vary widely, for example, state to state. Um, and so it's really essential that you're aware of those. In the resources that Laura and I will provide to you following this evening's chat, um, you will find a COVID-19 telehealth waiver that has just come through um, as an emergency measure that appears to change or relax a few guidelines to make telehealth a little more accessible to clients. So I invite you to take a look at that in response to our current circumstance if you're trying to adapt swiftly or if telehealth is new for you. I'll also provide a checklist for starting. Um, and these are just a series of questions that invite you to think about what access to equipment and technology you may have or your employer may have what access to equipment and technology your client may have, how you might participate in ensuring equitable access to equipment and technology for those who may not have it, um, and other questions such as these, what the requirements are, for example, for informed consent, um, both verbal and written, how you may screen clients, how you may intake them, either virtually or in person. Um, so I think that's those, those questions perhaps will be a really nice guiding frame to get you thinking about the considerations for starting your practice in this way. Um, in addition to our typical clinical competencies as dance movement therapists, our practice and our skills, we also have to think a little bit about telepresence. We have to think about our own personal technical competencies and or technical support where we may um, be seeking technical competencies. We can look for support for IT support, um, for um, telephone numbers perhaps that um, would support our hardware or any new app we may be trying or software we may be trying. All of this takes patience, it takes time, um, but support is there. It's, it's readily available if we, if we make the time for it. Um, we have to continue our legal and regulatory understanding um, for ethical practice and billing and reimbursement understanding. So for these, I encourage you to seek um, advice based on the populations that you serve and the geographic locations that you serve as to the legal, regulatory, ethical, and malpractice bodies guiding your work. And that is essential, I believe. Um, with regard to equipment, we typically begin with a device with a camera and many of our devices um, have cameras built in, but not all of them do. There can be some value in having um, an external camera in addition to your built-in camera, because this can allow you to move about in space. It can allow you to see 2D surfaces. For example, if you're using creative process, um, some drawing or writing in response to movement, a second camera may allow, may allow sharing of, of um, an example Perhaps you're drawing or showing an example. Um, so having an external um, camera in addition can just be um, a bonus. Um, whatever hardware is used to connect to the client, ensure that it's compatible with the software. So it can be um, a challenge if you notice an incompatibility there. It can sometimes be worked with, but it um, is really nice if you're um, purchasing new hardware um, to consider your software. Um, when you are making that purchase. You'll want to test equipment, equipment with the client, and I suggest this prior to the initial session that you actually schedule 30 minutes or an hour just for testing and troubleshooting together. Um, ensure during that hour that you have a backup plan for communication so that you have um, telephone communication or a secure messaging platform, um, as email is often not allowed unless it's encrypted. So you'll want to think about how you're going to maintain connection um, as a, in a secondary manner to the telehealth or primary telehealth connection. So we enter our first session. We've done all the good work, all the homework of getting to know our regulatory um, guidelines. And it's time to begin a first session. Um, it's essential that we have a comprehensive intake, just the same as we, did, we do in our regular in-person practice. 
um, that we are thorough in our medical histories or biopsychosocial histories and that we understand the client and screen them for appropriate um, for appro appropriate telehealth sessions. It's uh, essential that you spend that time. Um, it's important that during this intake, you also ensure the client has a private and safe space in which they can um, participate in therapy. Um, and you also want to familiarize yourself with the local emergency contacts um, to your client. Um, generally, you call 911 in the event of an emergency, just as you might otherwise, depending on the context of your practice, but it's essential that you have that emergency plan. Um, during my review of medical information and history, um, and during the comprehensive intake, I was constantly um, concerned with not only pain or discomfort, but also dizziness, sleep patterns, um, anything that could um, be fall risk with clients. Um, and then, as I've discussed, prepare yourself and your clients for communication gaps or lags in audio or video, um, which can be due to low signal. So sometimes moving a little closer um, to the signal can help. Um, even at the beginning of the call, Laura and I were playing with whether our phones should be picking up Wi-Fi or whether that was uh, destabilizing our internet connection. We wanted to have the best connection possible. Even inclement weather can impact signals. So all of these things can impact the signal. And then establish a plan with the client as to the troubleshooting protocol. So for example, simply stating and making explicit, if the phone call, if the video connection is lost, I will try you on your cell phone or on your telephone, or will you call me uh, by phone? to reinstate that connection so that you have a plan before the connection is lost um, is really essential. Um, I have just one more brief um, consideration here and then I'd like to stop for any questions that we may have. Um, in subsequent sessions, the, the, this is kind of still essential. At the beginning of every session, I assess again for fall risk, dizziness, sleep patterns, pain or discomfort, affect, mood states. Um, I ask the client if there are any new risks um, to be aware of in their environment today. Um, I confirm their telephone number for this session, their geographical location for this session, and I document that location in writing. Um, I ask if they've sustained any new injuries, exhibited any new symptoms that may get in the way of movement. And those adaptations for me are really essential, making explicit um, that I know where the client is at the beginning of each session. Um, their telephone number hasn't changed, their location hasn't changed. Um, okay, so are there any questions? There are definitely questions. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> um, okay, so. Um, here's a comment um, from Paul Savet. He is mentioning that having an Ethernet cable connection from modem to computer rather than Wi-Fi is a more as a stronger connection. Super, and, great. Team. Yeah, and I just want to acknowledge that um, I do not have an Ethernet um, connection, uh -huh. and uh -huh. as we are in California under um, shelter at home orders, yeah. um, so if, if you're experiencing any kind of problems with the Wi-Fi, that could be because um, I'm not grounded into the internet via Ethernet. So that's something to, to keep in mind. But that is how you can troubleshoot that. That's great. Thanks, Paul. Um, let's see here. Oh, you were talking about being mindful of um, fall risk and, and things of that nature. And I'm not sure if you actually addressed this as because I was reading through the questions as you were talking about it. But someone asked specifically, if you witness a client have an incident in their space while you're working with them, if there's a fall, how, how would you respond? So this varies client by client, and it goes back to that initial, um, that initial draft of a tr troubleshooting protocol. So you make, uh, I begin um, prior to the very initial session with a protocol that allows you to know what um, through the medical history um, and through asking about the environment um, and any loved ones that are nearby, I have a really good sense of the client's um, environment. 
and um, their local resources, who's in the home, and what their emergency contacts are. And this allows me to troubleshoot with them. For example, um, I work with a gentleman um, who has Parkinson's disease, and falling is a very typical part of his daily life. He has, um, he feels equipped to fall, although it's always very scary. Um, his wife is his primary caregiver and always at home and always nearby. So there would be an instance um, if he were to stumble back and maybe catch himself in the chair, for example, maybe he doesn't, I'm, I actually have never seen him go all the way to the floor, but catch himself in the chair and surprise himself, that I would, um, just as we might in person, um, be with him, notice how he is, assess whether or not there is injury in any way. And we might proceed, for example, with poetry writing for the rest of that session, some poetry or something, um, and, maybe, and maybe be done moving that day. So I think it's the same, very similar to the ways that we work in person um, versus um, documenting a full incident, say an, uh, an example of a client falling all the way down who has sustained injury and needing to call for help, 911, um, because it is a true incident. Wonderful, thank you. Um, let's kind of stay on the clinical response in the moment um, okay. thread. Someone else is asking, could you share some experience in coping with emotional issues of the client coming out during the session mm -hmm. without you being on site and, and you're only witnessing this from a virtual, um, that virtual space? Yeah. Beautiful. You know, I have observed that telehealth has a mediating effect in this regard. And I'm not sure that I could put my finger on it or um, have language for it, but there is a certain mediating effect you feel that is a kind of distance or container in and of itself through the screen. Um, but as we would in in-person um, practice, I noticed that many of the things we know that slows or assists in regulating emotion does the same via telehealth. And one of the things I hope to convey this evening is how much of our DT practice translates to telehealth with very little change to what we know and how we work. So I, I, f I find that in, in many instances, just a little distance through telehealth can moderate how much emotional expression, especially that, um, that emotional expression that's unregulated really comes up in this. The virtual distance space. Um, and also I noticed that many of the things that I would know to do in, in regular practice translate beautifully through telehealth. Thank you. Yeah. Another clinical question um, that has to do with privacy and safe space. Mm -hmm. Jenny, how have you handled working with past clients who did not have a private safe place to engage in a session? Uh, this, this clinician currently has clients who are declining meeting with me because they're home, their family's there, and they don't feel like they have privacy. Yeah. So we um, have had clients who have, um, have moved to library spaces, and that of course is varying community to community right now, depending on the spread of COVID-19. We've had folks working from a car when they have that resource available to them, um, from a porch. Um, so, so there have been a range of ways I've seen clients handle the issue of privacy. Um, and it is a very real issue at this time as we're all reevaluating how we're using space and many of us are under stay at home measures or shelter in place measures. Um, but those are a couple of ideas that I've heard most recently. Even a bathroom, just whatever quietest, most insulated space um, to get the care that they need. Yes. And that, that is so indicative of, of how we all are having to create our own safe yes. spaces in very small mm -hmm. residences right now. Um, That's right. That's right. Some more clinical-oriented questions. Mm -hmm. there, a couple people are asking about eye contact. Mm -hmm. What is your recommendation in terms of creating a sense of that connection, of mutual gazing? Very technically, do you look at the camera lens during the session? Are you looking at the, the image of the client? 
Yeah. So eye contact is something we actually talk about and even work on in, um, in therapeutic goals. So in order to make eye contact, you do look at the camera light. <laughs> you have to look directly at the camera in order to um, imitate eye contact or receive eye contact. But more frequently, the natural thing that happens in telehealth spaces is that eyes move about and we um, kind of adjust to the eyes moving about. Um, now, for example, because you all can't see my setup, I have um, some ideas here to the right of my camera. Um, so you've noticed my eyes moving to my ideas and then delivering them to you um, in this way. So if we don't know what's happening on the client's end, they may also be uh, glancing at something to their left or their right. Sometimes this is um, part of the therapeutic aim and sometimes it's distracting from the aim, right? Um, so frequently um, we notice the, eye, the eyes shifting in particular ways. And it is an adaptation we have to make um, to get more comfortable with not, not being able to hold gaze, mutual gaze as you're describing in some instances. It's one of the more difficult things to replicate. I'm experiencing that right now with you, Jenny. I'm looking at the light <laughs> and realizing when I look at the light, I'm not looking into your eyes. And, I know. And so that's a hard space as the clinician mm -hmm. to not see the face of mm -hmm. the client if you're also trying to convey mm -hmm. their being seen. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's, it is complex. It is complex. Um, I think we rely on some of our other felt sense um, and we are able to convey. And that is actually a point that I have um, here regarding adaptations that we rely more heavily on verbalization in a telehealth session. Um, than we do often in person, though this is not always the case. Um, we rely on the tone of voice, um, the pacing of the conversation. Um, it can be super useful to create a shared vocabulary from the start and to populate this with words from the client um, and from the client's point of view. Um, it can be really useful to acknowledge sensory inputs that are unusual or telehealth specific, like, um, funny audio, background noise, um, or traffic that's out of context for us, um, or even video um, can be difficult to adjust to. The light can be really different on the screen than it is, right? Because we can adjust the light and brightness of our screens. So it can be a real contrast to the actual environment we're in. All of those sensory inputs have to be considered. Um, but I think our verbalization and vocabulary can be a muscle that we strengthen um, in telehealth and really use it to convey our empathy and our connection with our clients. That's an excellent transition to this next question, which is how do you feel kinesthetic empathy and attunement is affected by telehealth within the therapeutic relationship? How do we work or prior, you know, how do we, how do we develop and, and honor that kinesthetic empathy in that situation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, um, what I notice is when we are moving together um, and it, it, at times eliciting emotion or making shapes that have meaning and we begin to story these shapes, tell, you know, write narrative or speak narrative about them, we, um, we meet one another in an empathic uh, in-between space. And... Um, I actually think we can be quite creative, innovative, and imaginative in the ways that um, words can populate what, is, what has often been a, our kind of kinesthetic experience. Um, so we have to be explicit about what we're experiencing too. And we have to um, have a therapeutic goal with our client to practice being explicit about their sensations and their experiences. Um, there, you know, we really have to suspend any assumption um, strengthen and sharpen our observation skills. Um, often we don't see the entire client's body in the screen or, and it's obviously unidimensional instead of three-dimensional, we can't see all sides. Um, so we have to adapt and make, you know, use of the therapeutic goal to say, um, I notice I'm sensing right now, I'm wondering what's coming up for you and what you're sensing or experiencing. Um, again, what I hope you see, and if I could emphasize it enough, is how beautifully our in-person practice translates to telehealth. Um, and that you, I, I believe once, once, once um, there's an experience with telehealth practice, you see that kinesthetic em empathy is developed through this virtual engagement. 
Thank you. There are some questions here, uh, multiple questions that have to do with facilitating groups. Did you ever facilitate a group session via telehealth? I did not, so I am beyond my depths in the question <laughs> of groups. I have experienced lots of groups um, through virtual engagement, but I have not facilitated a telehealth dance movement therapy group. Okay. I am going to share a resource with you all from Heather Spooner, my colleague from Creative Forces and Malcolm Randall VA Medical Center, who's a board certified art therapist, currently in practice, um, began the practice with me in 2014 and did um, a brief, I think a 10 minute talk for American Art Therapy Association yesterday. And so um, you will get a chance to hear her talk about leading art therapy groups through telehealth. Thank you. That's a helpful resource. A couple questions about working with specifically children who are nonverbal, but as someone who's worked with the elderly, wondering if perhaps you have worked with older clients who were less verbally oriented and if you have any tips or ideas about that. Yeah. So in, in, um, in my practice, structure has been really essential. So I noticed that I keep a really... Um, a really uh, consistent sequence beginning, middle, and end that we arrive at nearly in the first session and we commit to. And this predictability in a session's beginning, middle, and end has served really beautifully where verbalization cannot be relied upon. That's a very concrete suggestion. Yeah. So yeah. it can be a song at the beginning, a song at the end, <laughs> You know, I mean, just the way we shape our, our practices, but maybe relying a little less on our improvisational skills and a little more on our capacity to structure and sequence. Um, it makes a huge difference. As a matter of fact, I, I have a sweet story of a client who um, knew the structure so beautifully within, I don't know, four to six weeks that he started leading pretty much the entire session facilitating my experiences in many ways of moving together mirroring together warm up he kind of got the he got in a groove very quickly and began having a lot of great ideas for creative prompts and movement and it was a delight <laughs> it was a delight okay um, let's see so many questions we have literally 212 people on the line right now wow so. Hi, everybody. It's so wonderful to have you all here. It and is. trying to find the themes in the questions. Laura, while you do that, I have one more little section, if okay. it's useful. Okay. Um, I just wanted to, to zoom out for a second. Um, I have practiced in hospitals and small and imperfect and very stressful spaces for the majority of my practice, long before I adapted dance movement therapy to telehealth. I was adapting dance movement therapy one-to-one -one and in groups in very small, very imperfect, and very stressful, disruptive spaces. I know many of us can relate with this. Um, and what I want to remind us as dance movement therapists is the power of gesture work, the power of working small, um, the power of our imagination, improvisation, and the power of our um, kind of resilience in moments of disruption or interruption to come back together. Um, this is such a beautiful opportunity to, to practice our therapeutic goals in real time. So engaging breath when background noise or traffic is disruptive. Um, to um, work together to move through move move uh, past a frustration threshold when a video connection is lost, to simply have a client call back and try to get that connection back up, who generally can't tolerate that level of frustration, is meeting a therapeutic goal, even though it is not ideal. So I just want to invite us to remember the immense power of moving small the immense power of gestures, the immense power of changing our breath, how significant and documentable that is. Um, I've worked with children waiting on heart transplants who are on movement restrictions. Um, and in that instance, they direct me to dance their dreams and I'm dancing them. I'm picturing one who, <sighs> 
right? Just the perfect heartbeat. And she had me dancing it because if she had moved, she could have gotten a line infection. And we both knew how significant that was. Or working with antipartum moms awaiting a high risk delivery. What does DMT look like in that bed? Um, sometimes it's simply a breath. It's simply wiggling toes as dance movement therapy. I've had to get really um, with my clients, letting them lead um, how working tiny can be transformative for them. Um, so expanding movement repertoire, I just don't want us to forget how powerful it is to expand movement repertoire inward and what a vast inner landscape we have to explore in these tiny transformative moments. So again, telehealth is not perfect, but it is good and it's just, so there's a value in it. Um, and I think there's, there's real possibility in it. So I invite us to remember the power of tiny movement. Oh, excellent reminders. Thanks. Are there themes? I have one more section. There are themes. Okay, um, great. We have about 10 minutes though. Super. Um, have you, and you may have mentioned this before, so forgive me if you did, but have you personally done telehealth through your cell phone? I have not. Okay. Although I will mention again that um, telehealth waiver that has just gone into place with HIPAA that's relaxing guidelines, and I know smartphones in particular are mentioned in that waiver. So the American Psychological Association has a, a one pager breaking down that waiver, and it's a really useful um, entryway for those who hope to use smartphones and aren't sure about the guidelines. Okay, great. And I do want to acknowledge there are a number of people in our community who are online right now who have experience with different aspects that we're talking about, which is wonderful. We have such Great. rich resources yes. of experiential Great. knowledge here. Yes. So I'm just going to use this moment right here to remind the attendees, if perhaps you didn't hear this at the beginning of the session, that in the survey, when this webinar closes, you are asked the question if you would like to participate in a follow-up Zoom meeting where we can divide you into breakout, small breakout groups, perhaps even by population. And you can do face-to-face -face, um, best practices, sharing your knowledge, sharing your questions with one another. And for those of you who have experience working in these different capacities via telehealth, I would encourage you, invite you, hope that you will join us for those breakout sessions to share your, your wisdom with others who are just stepping into this for the first time. Yes, please. I hope that you can tell how much I'm stretching my own mind, body, and heart to be with you in your questions because my experience is so limited. So I'm grateful for our collective. We are stronger together. Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. So I will allow you, Jenny, to go to your final, okay. final thoughts as we're down to about seven minutes. Super. So my final thoughts are around sustaining practice. And it will be no surprise to our beautiful community that I'm concerned for our own care, caring for ourselves and how we sustain ourselves in this time with telehealth practice. Um, if you are brand new to telehealth, telehealth practice. I encourage you to commit to one session at a time and revisit how it's going throughout that session and at the end of the session. Just one session at a time. This is how at least I'm moving through every hour of the day at the moment. One step at a time, one breath at a time, one sleep at a time. So one session at a time. Um, plan for both yourself and your client to be making adjustments to the platform throughout your sessions on session number eight, on session number 18, we will be making adjustments. This is a time of being um, confident of our adeptness to adapt, right? Um, and in that confidence, we'll find the way forward here. We're confident that we're adept to adapt and that we're resilient as a human um, collective and, and all living beings are resilient. Explicitly check in throughout, check in with your client, check in with yourself. Yeah. Um, I also encourage you to think about your own personal, physical, and creature comforts with regard to screens. 
Um, and I think this is essential and it's iterative. It's not a one-off. It's something we continually check back around. So surround yourself with creature comforts when you sit down with your screen, a cup of tea, dark chocolate, water, a view of nature, your own art supplies. Some of these are basics. Some of them are over the top privileges, <laughs> but whatever you have at your fingertips, I recognize it's all relative, but these are just a few ideas. Surround yourself with creature comforts, probably best practice at this time anyway. So those comforts that you have at hand, we're certainly all appreciating those at this moment now that more than ever. Um, consider whether or not your space um, is adequate. Um, again, don't let the perfect get in the way of the good. It's all about balance, but is the space adequate? Can I safely deliver and privately deliver telehealth from the space? Organize your setup as you go. Organize as you go. Prioritize what's available to you and what comforts you the most. So your ease is of the utmost concern. Um, you might think about how you, how you could be hands-free. Bluetooth is great technology. Um, take note um, that you're protecting your hands, that you're preventing repetitive hand injury. Rest your hands where you can. Take note about eye strain. There are loads of resources about these things on the internet, but I just want to note them as essential for telehealth practice. Um, so there are settings in, in computers and devices for blue screen that protect and prevent eye strain. Notice the level of your seat, the level of your computer. Um, these are invaluable to protecting your spine and your alignment. Notice the quality of the light in your space. How does it change throughout the day and the evening? This is like one of the hidden gems in this moment for me right now. Um, now that we've slowed down, at least on the outside, <laughs> um, we're following the schedule of the sun the way our gardeners always have. And I think this is a hidden gem. So what is the quality of the light in your space? How does it change across the day? Are you sensitive to electric fields or electro electromagnetic exchange? And how might you mediate this? Um, note who has access to your space, how you can set clear boundaries around that. Make it fun, make it loving, hand paint a loving sign at your doors. Um, Note your auditory inputs, make them pleasant and beautiful and uplifting where you can control them. As Laura said, I encourage you to consider meeting with like-minded dance movement therapists or other creative arts therapists to compare telehealth practice, but it's essential in order to sustain practice in telehealth that you have the support, self-care and resources that you need. So this is where we must begin. I think that is essential. I would like to close my, mo my portion with a poem for us. I invite you to, um, if you're comfortable doing, doing so, rest your eyes a moment and receive words. And these are words of um, Rumi, the great poet, our Persian friend. So if you'll gently close your eyes and receive these words if they feel comfortable for you in this moment. Rumi wrote, keep moving, though there's no place to get to. Don't try to see through the distances. That's not for human beings. Move within, but don't move the way fear makes you move. I'll say it one more time. Keep moving, though there's no place to get to. Don't try to see through the distances. That's not for human beings. Move within, but don't move the way fear makes you move. So I invite us to pace ourselves, hydrate, wash our hands, get some rest. It's time for getting back to the basics now. One breath, one step, one sleep, one session at a time. And may those who are directly impacted and those on the front lines serving us all be held in safe keeping tonight. May our collective efforts be efficient, empathic, effective, and characterized by our beautiful embodied empathy, so unique to dance movement therapists. May all suffering be eased. May we co-create a better way. May it center equity and justice for all. And may we learn to follow the schedule of the sun the way gardeners always have. Thank you. Oh, Jenny, thank you so, so, so much. My pleasure. I just am on behalf of everyone who's listening and the wonderful comments that are coming in directed towards you. There's great appreciation right now um, for all you've shared. 
and the fact that you were willing to do this with hardly any notice. Thank you so much. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And thanks to the ADTA, Margaret and Laura and all the board membership, our students, colleagues around the world. Thanks. Yes, I just want to acknowledge the essential workers that our dance movement therapists yes. and mental yes. health yes. workers are. Yes. Thank you for yes. all you're doing yeah. for our community. Yes. Oh. Hmm. Now we dance flattening the curve. <laughs> Friends, we dance flattening the curve. Okay? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to invite you to do your flattening the curve dance as we say goodbye. <laughs> um, please give us um, your, your input on the survey. Mm -hmm. And um, resources remain available to you on the American Dance Therapy Association Facebook group. And you'll be hearing from us soon in response to your reaction to the survey. Thank you, everyone, Thank you. and good night. Good night.